In early 1977, Mike Han's Special Forces buddy in Vietnam, Doug Sapper, arrived in Hong Kong to set up a trading business. Next thing I know, I'm in Hong Kong and I go down to buy this Chinese junk. Guy that I was dealing with said, oh, well, you'll have to talk to Michael about that. He's, you're in luck, he's here. Took me into the office and there sitting behind the desk was Michael Han. And he was the head chogidar at the uh, Mugen Han Bank. I was impressed. A few months earlier, Han had moved to Hong Kong to drive the expansion of the bank's operations throughout Southeast Asia, from Singapore to Bangkok, Manila to Taipei. Michael had the ability. I mean, he could have built the ark if, it's, if he was so motivated, and he would got you involved in it. You just wanted to be with Michael. You wanted to help him. You wanted to be on board and things. Before long, Sapper was doing odd jobs for Michael Hand. You could say that I was the confidant and the trusted friend that he knew he could call and get whatever he needed. I mean, I wasn't a full-time employee. I had my own business. You know, it was just Michael would call me up and say, hey, come up, i got something for you to do. Go out to the airport and meet this guy. He's bringing in a bunch of money, make sure it gets back here to the office, knowing that I wouldn't blow it out of the water. Doug Sapper was no wilting flower. After leaving Special Forces, he became a vice president and head of security for a CIA-contracted airline in Cambodia. And he was one of the last three Americans to leave Phnom Penh as it fell to the Khmer Rouge. Nugent Han needed someone with Sapper's muscle to deal with a certain breed of clients the bank was attracting. In Hong Kong, they had gangs, and they're called triads. And they control the prostitution, the drugs, the gambling. And these are guys who, using the word unsavory, would be an upgrade. These guys were not a noodle merchant down on the, one of the alleys in Hong Kong. These guys were pretty hardcore. But the one that I remember most, he came into Nugent Hand one day and gave Michael a ton of money and said, do something with it, I'll be back in two weeks. And I, if I recall it correctly, Michael said, wait a minute, I'll give you a receipt for this, we'll count it. And the guy said, don't bother. He said, if you're gonna screw me, you're gonna screw me whether I've got a receipt or not. When you see several million dollars in hundred dollar bills on top of a table, makes you want to take your clothes off and roll in it, like a dog rolling a dead rabbit or something. On another assignment, Hand asked Sapper to go to South Africa to move half a million US dollars back to Hong Kong without being detected. At the time, South Africa was an international pariah and financial dealings were embargoed. Now I'm there six months and they finally said, we've got the package. I go get it. Now I've got to figure out how do I get it out of the country. And all the way to the airport, I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna turn out really, really bad. So I get to the airport. They said, uh, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going to Hong Kong. That's where I came from. Okay, they kind of smiled and said, how did you enjoy your stay in South Africa? And I said, beautiful country, you know, chit chat. And I'm thinking, oh, these guys are trying to see if I'm gonna get nervous or pee in my pants or whatever. He stamped the passport and said, have a safe trip, sir. They loaded the bags on the plane. Nobody looked in. I'm thinking, Whew, did I just dodge the magic bullet or is there a fix in here? Well, I get to Hong Kong and I go to the Hilton Hotel. And so I get a phone call. It's two guys. You got the package? I said, yeah. They come up to the room. They look at the package and they count it. And they say, you got a problem, pal. There's $50,000 missing. Hmm, okay. And I said, well, I don't have your $50,000. And of course they got pretty antagonistic. And I said, look, if I was gonna steal a $50,000, why don't I just take it all? I didn't have to come back to Hong Kong. And I said, gentlemen, you really don't wanna close the distance in a close space with me. This will not turn out in your favor. I said, you get on the phone and you call these rat shit bastards and you ask them what the fuck they did with that money. Well, they'd taken $50,000 out of the package to use in South Africa. So we had a very tense hour wait. And finally they called them and said, hey, it's cool, get the money and leave. But I had already planned on killing these two guys. 
I mean, it, this was not going to end well. These are the kind of things that can happen that can cause you to forget the training you had at the Dale Carnegie course. The client Sapper later discovered was the South African Intelligence Agency, and the money was to be used to fund positive propaganda for the apartheid state. After a dozen years in Southeast Asia, Sapper's contacts reached far and wide, and Michael Han was keen to tap into them. I mean, you could say that I was the confidant and the trusted friend that he knew he could call and get whatever he needed. He'd say, hey, do you know anybody in Chiang Mai or do you know it? Yeah, I know somebody. Well, it's the gateway to the Golden Triangle. You could find an opium den faster than you could find a McDonald's. Chiang Mai was a transshipment point for drugs themselves, and these guys up in Burma had money coming out the fucking wazoo. So they would have had to have a way to move it. What better way than Nugenhan Bank? An Australian, Neil Evans, ran Nugenhan's Chiang Mai branch. Neil Evans made a statement to us at a later point where he said he was left in no doubt that his role in setting up the office in Chiang Mai was to attract drug money. Following the bank's collapse, Neil Evans gave an exclusive interview to 60 Minutes Australia. I was expecting to attract mainly drug money. So most of the money that went through Nugent Hand here in Chiang Mai was drug money? All of it. All of it? Every cent? Every cent. How much do you think, all told, would you have put through Chiang Mai? 2.6 million US dollars. I went up to Chiang Mai, having only an address. John Dowd, an organised crime-busting New South Wales politician, visited the Chiang Mai office. I walked up the stairs, looked at two adjoining offices, one of which was the Nugenhan Bank, and on its left was the US Drug Enforcement Agency. I was gobsmacked. Evans had his office deliberately on the same floor as the American Drug Enforcement Agency. They're the people who tried to catch the drug traffickers. Part of Evans' social scene was to play cards with the local drug enforcement man and the local CIA man. According to Evans, they both knew exactly what the Nugenhan Bank was on about. If the American drug authorities knew what you were doing, why didn't they just simply arrest you, close you down? Well, for one thing, I wasn't trafficking. Uh, my whole reason for being here was money, which they were quite aware of and uh, couldn't give two hoots about, really. In mid-1977, Neil Evans was called to a meeting at the Nugenhan office in Hong Kong. During the meeting, Michael Han made a stunning announcement. Well, he told me and the others that were at the meeting that he'd been successful in arranging a contract with the CIA whereby the bank was to become uh, its paymaster, if, if you like. And the idea was that money would be deposited with the Nugent Hand Bank by the CIA through various channels and also that the Nugent Hand Bank would be the repository for funds coming in from various CIA enterprises, namely drugs in Thailand. I've always said that at one point Nugent Hand became the conduit bank for the CIA. There are businessmen and civilians all over the world that are part of a network. And these are people that the CIA has contact with. They're not spies. They're not agents per se. They're an asset. It was around this time that Michael Han began a major recruiting drive. He sought advice from King's Cross bar owner, Bernie Houghton, who investigators suspected of being a CIA asset. Over the next two years, Nugenhan would recruit a dozen former high-ranking military and CIA officers to run its international branches. Houghton was responsible for introducing what we called at the time the explosion of military personnel within the bank. Admiral Earl Yates, senior Navy officer and president of the Nugenhan Bank. General Roy Menor, Pentagon advisor, bank representative. General Ed Black, ex-commander US forces in Thailand, bank representative. Walt McDonald, former senior CIA man, bank representative. 
These were not your average bankers in what is not an average bank. By mid-1977, Nugent Han's expansion into Asia appeared unstoppable. The bank's thriving Hong Kong office was located on the waterfront in the prestigious Connaught Building, a few floors below the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And Michael Hand and his wife Helen rented a million dollar Hong Kong apartment. Michael Hand, I believe, at that particular juncture in his life could have run for public office. Now, focus on making new and Hannah success. Wasn't about to run for office, but he had the qualities that would have put him in that position. When Frank would come to Hong Kong, after the meetings and the glad handings and the night, man, he was on the prowl. He was rocking and rolling. And he was not a bad looking guy. And in many cases, he was just this big, gregarious, you know, crude in many ways reeked of cigar smoke, but I'll tell you what, there's a lot of women found that very, very attractive. But the banker's appearance of success was an illusion sustained by criminality and an arrogant belief that they would never get caught. When you become powerful and rich, you start believing you're omnipotent. You can't lose, you can't be hit. You're nine feet tall and you're bulletproof. And unfortunately, that is a very dangerous situation. The first cracks in the Nugent Hand facade appeared in July 1977, when Donald McKay, an anti-drugs campaigner in Frank Nugent's hometown of Griffith, disappeared from a hotel car park. The police found bloodstains on McKay's van and on the ground nearby. Drag marks, clumps of hair and three spent .22 caliber cartridges suggested that McKay had been assassinated on the spot and his body removed by the killer or killers. What we had in 1977 was the murder of Donald McKay. And let's not quibble about it, it wasn't a disappearance, it was a murder, full stop. The incident stunned the nation and had all the hallmarks of a political killing. McKay was the Griffith branch president of the Liberal Party who had caused the arrest of a number of locals of Calabrian descent who were involved in the cultivation of marijuana. McKay's death forced the government to set up a royal commission which focused on the drug trade emanating from Griffith. Rumours spread that the Nugent family's fruit packing and transport company was somehow involved in the drug trade. The allegations gained credibility when a Nugent company employee alerted authorities about his discovery of cash checks bearing the names of Bob Trimboli and Antonio Sergi, who were suspected of organising the assassination of Donald McKay. There were very suspicious names on checks people involved in the criminal milieu in Griffith. Well, this was a case where I thought there was a lot of smoke and there was a lot of fire. I directed that the corporate affairs start an ordinary investigation, not a special one at that stage, and get the auditors to go through the books. The auditors came back confirming that, in their opinion, there was a fraud. And then at that stage, the company started to behave very badly indeed. The first thing they did was sack the secretary the whistleblower, he was sacked. Then they sacked four independent directors that were screaming on the board about what about this money. And then there was a move started to sack the auditors. Frank Nugent's approach was to take a sledgehammer to crack a nut. The next thing we hear is that two ex-breaking squad detectives with notorious, and I mean notorious, reputations as standover men and hit men had been employed as private detectives to look after the matter. And that involved visiting the auditors at night in their homes and basically giving them a bad time. The tactic backfired when the media got hold of the story. The name Nugan was firmly and publicly associated with underworld crime. Attorney General Walker announced that a former drug squad detective, now working for the Corporate Affairs Commission, is to look into the Nugan Group. News of the Corporate Affairs inquiry into the Nugan family's firm caused a run on the Nugan Hand Bank, both in Australia and internationally. By week's end, 40% of depositors' funds had been withdrawn from the bank. To make matters worse, the Narcotics Bureau was investigating the Nugan Hand Bank. The operation was run by undercover officer Phil Bailey. 
would have been around May 1977. We got some information from an informant, Andrew Lowe. He was claiming that about these people, Nugent and Hand, that they were big time money dealers in the heroin business and that we should really look into them. He was indicating that he had first hand knowledge of this. Andrew Lowe was a major heroin dealer in Sydney. He told the Narcotics Bureau that he had worked briefly with Nugent Hand in 1975, dealing in bullion. He left the bank to manage a gambling den in Chinatown. One thing led to another and he began dealing heroin. Lowe said that he still maintained his relationship with Frank Nugent. One of his claims was that he would introduce people who were dealing in heroin to Nugent and Hand so that they could launder their money. Documents later uncovered in the ruins of the bank would back Lowe's claims. The Nugent Hand staffer overseeing most of the transactions was George Shaw. George Shaw was dealing with, I guess it was somewhere around about 20, 25 drug traffickers all up. And amongst those were a number of syndicates. The traffickers he was dealing with ranged, I guess, from middle-level drug dealers to big-time drug dealers. And the reason he had a focus on them was simply because if the word spread, and it was the proper word, they had a chance of attracting a lot more money into the bank and a lot more cash. And he stood to make large profits out of it. Phil Bailey was flying blind. He knew nothing about how merchant banks worked. Through an old school friend, he made contact with a merchant banker and sought his advice. Yeah, my former's opinion of the business itself was it was shonky. He didn't believe that it was a true merchant bank. He, at one stage, he said that the interest rates that they were allegedly paying just didn't make sense. He reckoned there was something more than a merchant bank there. He started making comments like, well, they've opened an office in Chiang Mai, and that would be like in Australia opening a merchant bank office in Griffith. Make about as much sense, he said. Having got the help of the merchant banker, the next stage I hoped was to be able to infiltrate the Nugent Hand Bank by getting one of their employees to become an informant. The banker said he knew someone working as a courier for Nugent Hand in Hong Kong, an Englishman by the name of Ron Paul Gafraim. He said that he was trustworthy and not the type to be involved in the drug business. Yeah, what happened was he said Paul Gafraim was coming to Australia and uh, he was going up to his office, so we arranged that I would go up there and just meet him, not as a narcotics investigator, but just to have a yarn to Paul Gafraim. Because one of the ideas was that uh, he might be an in into the inner workings of um, Nugent Hand. Unknown to Bailey, his merchant banker informant and Paul Gafraim were both directors of a small New Guinea airline. The airline's phone number in Hong Kong was identical to that of the Nugent Han Bank. Prior to the meeting, the informant warned Paul Gafraim that Bailey worked for the Federal Narcotics Bureau. Unfortunately, that didn't work out at all. In fact, he was very tight-lipped about and everything. Phil Bailey's attempt to infiltrate Nugent Han was doomed before it began. In late 1977, John Dowd, then a rising star in the New South Wales Liberal Party, received a startling telephone call. He said he was a British Secret Service agent and he indicated he wanted to talk about the Nugent Hand Bank. He came to Sydney. I went with my secretary and we picked him up. In Macquarie Street, I stopped opposite the office of the Nugent Hand Bank. You can't feign the genuine terror in this man. He was genuinely afraid of this contact with the building. What he said conveyed to me that he wanted to do anything he could to help me get them. He was obviously trying to encourage me to keep going on the issue and to, in effect, say that I was on the right track. On Dowd's advice, the British agent flew to Melbourne and gave a deposition to the Federal Narcotics Bureau. He told them that he'd met with Mike Hand in Hong Kong to discuss a possible directorship with the bank. Hand, he said, confessed that Nugent Hand was moving black money. Things became murkier when Bernie Houghton's name was mentioned. 
Wilcox had come across the King's Cross bar owner during the Second World War when Houghton worked for US military intelligence. Wilcox told the Narcotics Bureau that Houghton was still associated with the CIA. Wilcox later met with Frank Nugent in Hawaii. Nugent was drunk and babbling things such as we Nugent hand do the bastards over. Anybody who gets in our way we can take care of. We put people away. Wilcox walked out on Nugent, having declined the offer of a directorship with the Nugent Hand Bank. When Frank Nugent learned of the Narcotics Bureau investigation, he flew to Canberra to confront the Bureau chiefs head on. He told them that Nugent Hand were upright and honest bankers. How depositors made their money, he said, was none of his business. And he invited the Bureau to inspect Nugent Hand's books. Some of the customers, he warned, were very powerful people in business and politics. Knowing that you're crooked, but uh, fronting up to the head of the investigation department and letting him saying, I'm straight, and uh, why are you investigating me? Yeah, that takes a lot of gall. Five weeks later, the Bureau ceased its active investigation into Nugent Hand. But the net result was there was a uh, minute put on the file saying that the investigation was to come to a halt until further notice. The real sad part about it from my point of view is the fact that we're obviously getting so close to the truth without knowing it when the investigation was stopped. Frank Nugent had picked up a get out of jail card, but the stress was taking its toll. Nugent at that stage was an alcoholic. He was going through over a, in excess of a bottle and a half of scotch a day. He'd have a, a glass of scotch on his desk at eight o'clock in the morning. Word got through to Mike Hand in Hong Kong about Frank's drinking and how he'd become extremely abrasive, denigrating and insulting towards his secretaries and sales representatives. Staff complained about his verbosity, pathological lying and decreasing ability to convey his thoughts in writing. Nugent's remedy for most problems was to spend money. He used depositors' funds to decorate his waterfront home and leased a fleet of cars for his executives. One legal staff equipped, they gave me a car, they gave me a Mercedes, they gave everyone a Mercedes. But money couldn't keep the authorities at bay. In late May 1978, Frank Nugent and his brother Ken were arrested. The corporate affairs investigation into the Nugent Fruit Group had found substantial evidence of fraud. Depositors were soon turning up in person at the Sydney office, wanting to withdraw their money. International deals evaporated and budding relationships collapsed, including one with Lloyds Bank in Manila. Mike Hand allegedly warned Nugent that the entire box and dice was on the line. The last thing the bank needed was for the firm's CEO to go to prison. Nugent promised Hand that the fraud case would never get to court. He then set about making certain that was the case. Coming up in part three of Merchants of Menace. Frank Nugent was prepared to offer $50,000 to anyone who could compromise me as Attorney General. They just told me they could make arrangements to get me into Australia and that they'd get me out. Yeah, no, excuse me. Why do you have to come all the way to Hong Kong to try to find a hitter? You can go down to King's Cross and get a pimp to do this. Amongst his property was a Bible they found in the car. And in the Bible, it was indicated to me that there were certain passages, sentences and words that were underlined. Wife, children, death. And I drew the inference from that, that person or persons were a serious threat to his wife and children. This podcast is derived from the book Merchants of Menace, the true story of the Nugent Hand Bank scandal. Available at www.merchantsofmenace.net. Right now, we're all at home, but that doesn't mean we can't still support our local Aussie retailers. Stay safe, get what you need, and shop over 40,000 Aussie retailers today on eBay.